Welcome back to Sailing Northern Breeze, Episode 4. In this episode, we'll transit southern Greenland and through a protected passage called Prince Christian Sund. And there we'll begin our crossing across the Denmark Strait and the Greenland Sea to Iceland. Here you see the southwestern entrance to the Sund. Fog and icebergs mark the beginning of this day. So today we'll take a couple of minutes to talk about sailing with icebergs. On the top left side of this map, you can see our starting point at Nanertalik. Our route begins in the open ocean for about 25 miles and then turns north into the protected Sund. We had little wind this day, so the open ocean portion, while quite rolly, was not difficult. We left early in the morning and were in the Sund by 10 a.m., planning to reach the abandoned weather station for a stop overnight at the exit of the Sund. Our friends on the Scottish boat had left a few days before us, made it through the Sund out into the open ocean on the other side, but got caught in ice and had to turn back. They returned to the village of Apalaktok to wait for a better sailing opportunity. So we both set out on the same morning, albeit from different locations. The Norwegian boats had also laid over in this village, so there were four of us on the move to the weather station today. And we started to see ice as soon as we made our way in the early morning fog. So now let's talk about that sailing with icebergs. We'll go back to Canada to start this discussion. The yellow green track on this chart is the path of the northern breeze from Halifax through St. John's and to Greenland and then on to Iceland. The other tracks are those of our buddy boats, Swiss, Norwegian and Scottish. Why did we not travel with them? Taking shorter hops from landmass to landmass. Well, ice has our respect. We're from Canada and the US. We had toured the Titanic exhibit in the Halifax Museum last year. That was the landing place for many of the Titanic's victims' bodies, and they were buried near there. We decided to do our best to avoid the icebergs. This chart is a joint publication of three nations, Denmark, USA, and Canada, and it shows the icebergs in our area on the day that we left St. John's. The numbers in each small box represent the number of icebergs in that quadrant. Our route, shown in green, was planned to stay southeast of the bergs that were being pushed into this region by the southeast flowing Labrador current. Our buddy boats traveled between Labrador and Newfoundland, risking more ice. The quadrant circled in red they had to pass through, and it was expected to host 33 icebergs that day, and there were many more coming southeast behind those 33. Hence our successful choice. We saw no bergs until the last few hours as we approached Greenland. We had eight days without them. Our next leg, northeast to Iceland, has another set of ice charts. These ones published by the Danish Meteorological Service. The green, yellow, and brown swatches of color represent ice flows, which is between 10% and 80% of sea coverage with ice. The icebergs are shown separately. They are black triangles, dense icebergs, white triangles, less dense. And then the bergy bits, they're smaller pieces of ice, are shown by the truncated triangles who've had their tops lopped off. The Greenland current carries the spring icebergs down the coast where they wrap around the southern tip, intersecting with the Labrador current coming down from Canada's north. Our route to Iceland requires us to cross this Greenland current and its icebergs for about 50 miles off the coast and then after that we'll have clear sailing to Iceland. This is the same current that sent the Scottish boat back into the Sund a few days earlier. So we headed out. This picture shows that a couple of our buddy boats went north in this bergy area. The Norwegian boat in green on our schedule didn't get far before deciding the ice was too heavy to continue north. The Swiss boat shown in light yellow followed a couple of weeks later and they got further, but they also got trapped in a bay by pack ice and had to fall an aluminum hulled boat to break through. Our fiberglass boats aren't really suited for bashing through pack ice, but the aluminum steel boats can manage a little ice. On the plus side, our Swiss boat friends did get to see a polar bear swimming by, for which we are very jealous. The northern breeze is marked here by the two black arrows from Canada and from Greenland. So that's enough about sailing plans with icebergs. We entered the sound about 10 a.m. and enjoyed magnificent views, similar to Tezemuth Fjord from a couple of days earlier. The only habitation that we saw was at the village of 
Hapa Laktok, and that was difficult to see as it was tucked away into an inlet. The fog lifted and we began to see the passage. At times it was very wide, open and ice free. As we go further, we'll see it get quite narrow and we'll see some smaller bergs than these ones. These birds are intimidating and certainly not something you'd want to be surprised by in the fog or in the dark. We do have radar, but in this confined space it, is, it has difficulty seeing even these large birds. And you'll see as we approach this one, much of it is underwater. This one deceives us with an ice shelf that extends far to the right, almost fully submerged. Nothing you'd want to get close to. The dark strikes on the birds are from one of two sources. Either they are former surfaces of the glacier from ages past, when melting caused an accumulation of debris to settle out, and then more snow and ice accumulated on top. Or alternatively, they could be from areas of early fractures that filled up with meltwater, accumulated algae growth and debris, and then later refroze. These smaller bergs are being calved from the glaciers inside Prince Christian Sund. Radar cannot see these well at all, they are the size of cars or trucks, so you still don't want to hit them. We kept a 24-hour watch above decks for all of our crossings. Some sailors that we watch, they just pop their heads up every 15 or 20 minutes, but we chose the 100% watch option for this reason. We don't want to hit anything, ever. And now some of the Greenland ice cap becomes close enough to see the glacier is starting to appear up top. and we started to see waterfalls, hundreds of waterfalls, 10,000 year old glacier fed. I would have loved to get some of this water, but we wanted to get to the weather station before dark, so didn't have time to launch the dinghy for a trip to the waterfalls. This is the first big glacier that we spotted in the Sun. If we had waited here, I'm sure that we could have seen more bergs being born, but we needed to make our way while the pass was clear and the weather favorable, so we didn't stop. A missed opportunity for sure.
Just about this time, we received a radio call from our Scottish friends who were many miles ahead of us already at the weather station. They had decided to continue, taking advantage of the weather and visibility, and not stop for the night. They were leaving the Sund and heading for Iceland, about a four-day sail. The Norwegian boats on the radio call also decided to do the same thing, so we had a decision to make. We could stop for the night as planned at the weather station, sail on alone tomorrow morning, or we could press on, follow these other three boats, and be in a group for the crossing. Even if we were still going to be hours behind, 20 or 30 miles behind them, we wouldn't be alone out there. After about an hour of communication and analysis, we decided to follow them. Almost. But if a plan works, we won't be stopping at the exit of the sound at the weather station. We'll get an update from them. They'll be 20 to 30 miles ahead of us out in the ocean and they'll tell us what they see and the conditions good. By the way, the Coast Guard came on the radio to admonish us for using channel 16 for this conversation. Who knew they were here? Great to know that they were available had we needed them. We quickly got off channel 16. Breaking up the journey, we saw two small cruise ships, at least one of which was heading to Nanner Talek, based on what we'd been told earlier. We're now in a lot of vacation pictures taken from the deck of this ship. Most of them probably prefer their situation warm and dry up there, but I bet at least a few of them were jealous of our freedom and adventure on our little boat. In here, the sun is becoming quite narrow. This area was choked closed with ice just a few days earlier. The wind is blowing free, so we're unable to pass through, and this is the height of summer. It's July 16th. By the time we got to the abandoned weather station, we had lost radio contact, but we were able to contact the other boats ahead of us by satellite text messages. They were more than 20 miles offshore by now, and conditions were great. Good winds, excellent visibility, calm seas, and few icebergs. We pulled down an updated weather grid file from the satellite and we studied it. We decided we had the information we needed, and we set sail, making a run for to Iceland. 7 p.m., July 16th, and we're off. Greenland in our rearview mirror. And each week we like to say thanks because nobody does these things alone. So this time it's the Baltic for building this great boat. Heath Yeoman for hooking us up with the previous owner, Joseph Burke. New England Boat Works for patiently helping us launch her in 2019. And finally, Finn Hartnett, the top mass sailing in Kingston, Ontario, for helping us sail her from Rhode Island to New York City on our maiden voyage beginning our RYA credentials on the way. Thanks everybody. So see you all soon in episode five, the midlight, midnight run through the Greenland bergs and on to clear seas towards Iceland. Bye for now.